Good evening, everyone. Welcome back um, to the Word of God. Um, tonight's talk is entitled, Jesus Kept on Increasing. And, of course, uh, we're drawing from the uh, gospel record of Jesus' life. Um, the Gospel of Luke describes Jesus' early childhood in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, saying, The child grew and became strong, becoming full of wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, um, where it says he became strong, his strength might refer to physical strength or to mental strength, but I think reflexively we should imagine that that's referring to spiritual strength, his, um, his uh, fortitude against the flesh, his um, endurance against the wiles of the flesh, even as a young, at a young age. We're inclined to think that wisdom only comes with maturity and life experiences in the world, but the Bible tells us that true wisdom, as Jesus was becoming full of wisdom, derives from paying attention to God's instruction. Proverbs is full of the sort of instruction that made Jesus wise ahead of his years, and I was a little inclined to maybe uh, be begin tonight uh, with the reading from uh, Proverbs chapter 3, which is a very good example of the sort of counsel that Jesus would have taken to heart from a very young age, um, reading it as a, a letter uh, from his Father God. For example, uh, Proverbs 4, verse 3, and, and what follows in the same, in, uh, following along in the same sentiment says, When I was tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then my father taught me and said to me, Hold fast to my words. Who was Jesus' father? Uh, God himself, of course. Hold fast to my words, God was saying to his son Jesus. Keep my commandments, acquire wisdom and understanding. And that acquiring means not only um, taking wisdom and understanding, but keeping it, uh, uh, storing it up. Uh, God says, do not forget, do not turn away from my words, but love and prize them. Now we know that Jesus had several uh, half-brothers and half-sisters, um, children born to Joseph and Mary, but uh, this Proverbs uh, 4 verse 3 uh, refers to when I was tender and the only son in the sight of my mother. So uh, this proverb related to Jesus was even um, applicable to him even before his brothers and sisters were born, uh, which again indicates uh, Jesus at a particularly young age. Psalm 22, uh, which describes the crucifixion, is of course prophetic of Jesus. And we read, read from verses 9 through 10 these sentiments. You, God, made me to trust when I was upon my mother's breasts. From birth I was cast upon you. Today's English version uh, renders that uh, this way. I relied on you, or I depended upon you. Um, teaching us that Jesus was dependent upon uh, God even, even as a baby. There are slightly different renderings of that to uh, indicate the different interpretations and the different emphases, but essentially that's what it's getting at. So the wisdom that Jesus acquired throughout his childhood came first and foremost from taking heed to God's word. So when we read of Jesus at age 12 in the temple at Jerusalem and hear of him asking and answering questions among the religious teachers, and when we listen to him say to his mother Mary that he must be involved in the things of God, then this brief record becomes to us a representation or example of Jesus' past 12 years of growing up since his birth. Luke could probably have chosen from many hundreds or thousands of events in Jesus' childhood, uh, which his friends or family would have recalled to someone like Luke. Um, so Luke could have drawn from possibly countless testimonies of Jesus as a child in a way to illustrate uh, Jesus' relationship with his Father God. But Luke might have chosen this event 
because age 12 was traditionally the time when Jews entered manhood. So we'll just, just read that again briefly. His parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when Jesus became 12, uh, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan. And they went a day's journey without him. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And it came about that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So, as I suggested, Luke might have chosen this event because this was the transition point from boyhood to manhood uh, traditionally in, in Israel. Jesus had had his bar mitzvah and was now regarded as a true son of the law and one of the congregation of the Lord. You can uh, read, for example, the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 64, and also the apocryphal book, 1st Esdras, uh, chapter 5, verse 41, which uh, refers to that tradition. Luke's record of Jesus at age 12 shows us what a true son of the law uh, was, was really like what a real man of the congregation of the Lord was really like. In other words, what a true Israelite was really like. That is, anyone who is involved in the work and service of the God of Israel. As Jesus said to his mother, uh, she asked him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And Jesus said to Joseph and Mary, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Or, put another way, did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? And so that, that really was the epitome of a true son of the law, a true Israelite, being about Father God's business. So age 12 is not just a summary or conclusion or, or monument to Jesus the youth, it also introduces us to Jesus the man, which is to say, Jesus the perfect man. Luke chapter 2 ends by saying that Jesus kept on increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So he had been um, growing in wisdom, stature earlier, but he, uh, he continued on the same course. He did not veer from it through, through the days, weeks, months and years that, that preceded. And in that one short verse, Luke summarizes 18 years of Jesus' life in which he went through his teenage years and then through into his 20s, but which the Bible has uh, given us no, no actual recorded details. All that Luke has recorded are the important relevant facts, the things that counted as far as God is concerned which is not to say that there weren't other important and relevant facts that could have been recorded, but as we read in the Gospel of John, the whole world could have been filled with books about, uh, about Jesus, his ministry, and his life. Uh, but um, obviously, Luke was inspired to render down the relevant important facts to that short, uh, short uh, ev um, record that we have there of Christ in the temple. As, as a 12-year-old. Luke described the things that made the big difference, the difference between being just another man and being qualified to be the saviour of the world. Because Luke tells us that Jesus became full of wisdom as a child and yet continued to increase in wisdom as he grew through his adult years, this teaches us, uh, for one thing, that Jesus didn't have all understanding and discernment straight away. He needed to learn things over time. That is to say, he needed to grow in his knowledge and understanding, uh, discernment, and uh, from their wisdom. Evidently, there were experiences and situations during Jesus' childhood for which his then present level of wisdom was sufficiency, 
uh, was sufficient or his capacity for knowledge and understanding was at the moment sufficient and he could decide rightly he could um, he could rely on the word to guide his steps uh, in in the sim simple um, environment of childhood evidently there were other situations in which Jesus would discern that his present level of wisdom was insufficient so that he could only wait on God for the solution. In this way, God was continually extending Jesus, uh, increasing his capacity for spiritual knowledge and understanding and discernment and wisdom and fitting him for more demanding and challenging experiences. But at the same time, he was continually uh, drawing Jesus into higher ground spiritually and by doing so Jesus was being slowly incrementally drawing nearer and nearer to God a principle that's actually um, expressed in, in the early verses of uh, John's gospel and this agrees with the process described in Proverbs Proverbs 1 verse 5 a wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Proverbs 9 verse 9, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser, or he will become wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will add to his learning. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith. Now, I reflexively think of James speaking to those who are um, lacking wisdom and manifest the fact they might come across as fools or dullards in some way. But the fact is, uh, the exhortation could be made to anybody because people can have a certain level of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, but uh, still be needing more for the exigencies of life to which God will um, draw them through into places where they need greater wisdom. And that lack can only be made up by asking of God and receiving of God. Later on, we see that Jesus continued to go to God for insight or guidance during his ministry. For example, John chapter 5, verse 30, where he says, and, and he's in his public ministry now, I can yet do nothing of my own initiative. As I hear from God, I judge. So Jesus wasn't fully, um, fully equipped with the knowledge that he might need through his public ministry. He was still hearing from God and still um, judging in accordance with what he was hearing from God. Chapter 8, verse 16, My judgment is true, for I am not alone in it. Which is to say, his judgment was that which came from God. Now, I said earlier that the Bible has recorded no details of the 18 years when Jesus was aged between 12 and 30. But actually, we have quite a few insights into what life must have been like for Jesus as a young man, and also some evidence of Jesus' personality and behavior. And we have these insights because we know that Jesus made the scriptures his rule or standard of life and living. Thus, Jesus could be called the word made flesh. And as we read in Revelation, this, this is the man whose name is the word of God. So getting to know the scriptures is uh, uh, effectively the same as getting to know the personality and character and temperament of Christ himself. There are a lot of ancient writings that claim to record real events from Jesus' early life. Uh, these are the apocryphal gospels. They describe bizarre and fanciful things which Jesus is supposed to have done as a child or a young man. For example, the Gospel of Thomas describes Jesus as a young child creating live animals and birds out of clay just to impress his friends. It also describes him miraculously altering or repairing Joseph's carpentry work. For example, he was able to stretch a length of timber uh, that was too short for the job. 
Um, he also, according to the Gospel of Thomas, rebuked and cursed his school teachers, who then dropped dead. But these writings are all late, uninspired fables and don't add anything to a true insight into Jesus' early life, and they actually clash or grate terribly with the, with the record that we have in the four Gospels. I'd like us to take the time to consider some of the inspired scriptural testimony that gives us hints or clues or suggestions as to Jesus' life and personality as a young man. Obviously, we need to be careful to not make wild guesses or to be dogmatic, but I believe we can make reasonable inferences. Here is an example of one theory that we cannot be dogmatic about. We read that Jesus increased in stature. This can mean that Jesus grew older. It can also mean, or it might alternatively mean, that he grew larger and taller. But growing older normally correlates to growing larger and taller uh, when, when you're in your youth. Luke seems to be saying something so normal and obvious that it goes without saying. So why did Luke emphasize it? Was it just to describe that Jesus was a healthy specimen? I think maybe it tells us that Jesus was an early maturer because Luke is describing him at the time um, before his teen years. Maybe he was an early maturer so that he grew up faster and sooner than most boys. Maybe Jesus looked older than his years throughout his life so that when Jesus was only in his early 30s, we know that the Jews said to him at John chapter 8, verse 57, that he was not yet 50 years old. And we might ask, well, why didn't they simply say, you're not yet into your mid-30s, or you're not yet 40 years old? They said, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen our father Abraham? Maybe they simply rounded the figure up, but maybe Jesus actually looked as if he was in his uh, mid to late 40s. I think this is a, a reasonable inference, but uh, we could not possibly be dogmatic about it. Another thing Luke says is that Jesus increased in favor with God. Obviously, a lot could be said about this description of Jesus. This was Jesus' most important and essential characteristic. It is that one characteristic above all else that distinguished Jesus from all other people and qualified him to be God's appointment as Messiah and, and, and Savior, his favor uh, uh, with his Father God. This phrase refers not only to Jesus' faith and obedience, but also especially to his love for God and the intimate fellowship between the two of them. For example, this is described in Isaiah 66 verse 2. God looks to the one who is humble and contrite of spirit, as Jesus certainly was, meek and lowly, he described himself as. The verse in Isaiah goes on to say, the one who trembles at God's word, which implies reverential respect and awe. And obviously, these attributes, humility, um, contriteness of spirit, and that uh, reverential trembling at God's word is not a hit and miss affair. It's not an occasional, um, a, an occasional attribute. These were continuing abiding attributes um, that God looks to and which he uh, beheld in his son Jesus. Psalm 147 verse 11 says, The Lord, that is the Lord God, favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. And again, he's, he's describing about an abiding fear and an abiding faithfulness uh, that waits for his loving kindness. We get some insight into Jesus' spiritual behavior or practice from Luke chapter 4, verse 16, which reads, As was his custom, Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The Greek is emphatic there. It says that this was the custom of him. In other words, he made it his own custom. It wasn't just a custom that he adopted from his peers or from his, his community. He made it his own. 
he, uh, he, he, he owned that custom to enter the synagogue every Sabbath and uh, there he stood up to read. Throughout his life, on a weekly basis at least, without fail, Jesus attended fellowship. For him, it was a habit. Throughout his adult life, from age 12 onward, he had willingly volunteered to contribute to the service by reading the scriptures and probably expounding them as well. The congregation, for example, at Luke chapter 4 verse 20, expected Jesus to speak. And as we learnt of, of Jesus in the temple, not only was he asking them questions according to verse 6, but they were also listening to him. Who were listening to him? The teachers, the teachers of the law. They were listening to Jesus um, and obviously he was speaking about the things that pertained to the law and, and the rest of the scriptures. Verse 47 says, All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So he was answering, quest answering questions that other people were putting to him. Or he may also have been asking questions which the teachers could not answer, but which uh, Jesus then volunteered to answer himself. And uh, thus it was that uh, Jesus was, was well able to uh, expound on the scriptures every Sabbath in the synagogue in Nazareth. Throughout his life then on a weekly basis, uh, he made it his habit. From uh, Deuteronomy 6 and, and uh, uh, Deuteronomy 11, we read of God's exhortation to the Jews to impress his words on their hearts and on their souls. And he instructs them, as it were, to attach his words to their hands and foreheads and on their doors and gateposts. And obviously we can apply this as a, as a metaphor or, or, a, or, a, or a simile or a synonym as if to say keeping it in, in, your, in your mind and uh, uh, using your hands to always be fulfilling God's word. But he also says to put God's word on the doors and gateposts. So God does seem to be saying do these things literally. Even though Jesus decried the ostentatious and ceremonious use of phylacteries by many Jews, according to Matthew 23 verse 5, phylacteries uh, entailed um, wrapping um, cords around the arm to uh, uh, record scriptures left, um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the tapes or cords, but also actually tying a little box on their forehead with scriptures in it and, and uh, having it uh, always on their forehead. And Jesus decried that sort of ostentation, that sort of um, uh, spectacle. Nevertheless, I could, I could well imagine Jesus, especially as a boy, observing God's exhortation, somewhat literally writing down portions of scripture to put around his home or workplace, or even on his portion, on his person, amongst his clothing. And I imagine that Jesus, who was born King of the Jews, of course, was obedient to God's commandment in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, which applied to the kings that were yet to come in the nation of Israel, when God said, The king whom God chooses to set over Israel, he shall write for himself a copy of the law on a scroll from before the presence of the priests. And Jesus may well have spent several years of his spare time as a teenager carefully and thoughtfully writing and memorizing the whole law, psalms and prophets. Maybe not even as a teenager, but as, as a youngster, he may have done that. Uh, presumably the Nazareth um, synagogue was um, accessible to him at, at nearly all times. And not only would he attend on the Sabbath, but in his free time, he would have visited the rabbi whenever he could and uh, made, uh, made himself available to the written word of God there. Jesus did not only grow in favor with God, but also with man, so Luke says. From this I take it that among those who knew him as he grew up, Jesus was well liked, he was admired, and he was respected. We do read, of course, in Isaiah that he had no 
form or comeliness that uh, men would desire him. But as a youth, as a youngster, he was evidently uh, had, had the favor of the people in his community. Evidently, Jesus had a personality and manner about him that endeared him to people. It did not alienate him from them. Jesus' intense love for God and holiness did not make him distant or separate from people around him. On the contrary, Jesus knew that, um, as Scripture says, the person who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And the one who loves God should love his brother also, as we read in John's epistles. Jesus knew that from a young age. And so uh, whenever he was in contact with people, he was agreeable to them. He was uh, receptive to them. He was available to them uh, in, in whatever capacity. Jesus must have been the sort of person who was always available for other people and who uh, cared about them and showed that he cared in whatever way he could as an infant or as a youngster. He must have always been, as I say, approachable, attentive and responsive to people in a way that acknowledged them and made them feel valued by Jesus. We don't always see that uh, among youngsters, among children. They tend to be fairly uh, self-absorbed and uh, are possibly a little self-important. Or, on the other hand, they might be rather shy, rather introverted. Jesus was neither of those things. He, he was the sort of uh, whimsical child that was very agreeable to adults, I believe. Um, I have a... Um, a relative who's only age nine, and he's um, proven to be a very likable personality. I can remember when he was aged maybe three or four, and uh, he used to get into little tantrums and things, but obviously he's been uh, well disciplined and uh, well socialized. And I can see in someone like him, and there'll be others, of course, that you all know, that uh, give you some insight into how even as a young child a, a, a person can grow in favor with other people. Now there are three guiding principles for demonstrating love which I believe Jesus manifested throughout his life. You may be able to uh, elaborate on more principles but uh, I've got here one, be willing and ready to meet or serve people's needs which is to say be considerate of their needs. Two, don't be easily offended at people's faults or weaknesses. And three, be considerate not to cause offense um, <clears throat> oneself. That is to say, be conscious of the, the scruples of other people and to not be uh, stepping on toes un unnecessarily. And generally speaking, amongst youngsters, uh, any stepping, off, uh, stepping on toes is unnecessary. Obviously, the, uh, the principal chapter that we would resort to is 1 Corinthians 13 from verses 4 to 8. Think of this in terms of Jesus, first of all, but then think of it in terms of your own self and, and my own self. You can, as you read this, put your own name in there. I will, I will um, refer to Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind and is not jealous. Jesus does not brag and is not arrogant. Jesus does not act unbecomingly. In other words, he has, has a decorum about him, a courtesy about him. Jesus does not seek his own. Jesus is not provoked. Jesus not, does not take into account a wrong that he has suffered. Jesus does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus bears all things, or as uh, the margin says in my New American Standard, covers all things. And that certainly is applicable to Jesus himself, who, who is our atonement. Jesus believes all things, that is, he believes the best for all things hopes all things, and endures all things. 
Verse 8, Jesus never fails. I couldn't put my own name in there because it wouldn't have applied <laughs> quite the same. Jesus summarized these principles as loving your neighbor as you love yourself. A principle, of course, which um, uh, harks back to the uh, early biblical times anyway. In these ways, Jesus perfectly fulfilled Proverbs 3, verses 3 to 4, which says, Do not let kindness uh, or mercy and truth forsake you, so that you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and men. So here, the emphasis is on kindness and on truth, um, by which one can find favor and good repute in the sight of man, let alone in the sight of God. Luke tells us that Jesus did find favor from God and man, and John tells us the reason Jesus was f the reason for that. Jesus was full of grace and truth. After Mary and Joseph found Jesus at the temple, we read that Jesus returned to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them. This means he remained subordinate and obedient to them. Clearly Jesus was not a rebellious or defiant or disputative young man. He didn't resist his parents' authority. But because of the specific context of Jesus being found at the temple, I believe Luke was emphasizing a particular sense in which Jesus was subject to his parents. Because we can imagine, I think, Jesus having a strong desire to remain in Jerusalem rather than continuing to live in Galilee. Galilee is a beautiful region, and um, to the natural man, it has a lot to recommend it over uh, Jerusalem, unless you're interested in ancient history, of course, and uh, ancient, um, ancient buildings. But Jesus was invested in Jerusalem because, of course, that was where uh, God's temple was, principally. Most of the Hebrew Bible relates to events in and around Jerusalem, so Jesus would have had a keen interest in the area. It was the city of the Jewish kings. It was the seat of the temple of God. So for Jesus, it was his spiritual home. His heart and affections were there. Also, in Jerusalem, he would have, would have had daily contact with Bible scholars and teachers people whom Jesus would have found intellectually stimulating and perhaps even challenging. That, that is to say that they were people that would have um, been able to sharpen his, his wits against and sharpen his, his keen understanding of the scriptures. Um, I'm not saying that Jesus would have liked to have provoked argument and disputation with them at the age of 12, but there would have been a knowledge amongst the uh, teachers of the law, um, as well as, as a lot of um, experience that they had that Jesus could have drawn from to learn, uh, which he might have perceived was, it was not going to be experienced um, in, in um, Nazareth. Jesus probably wished to contribute more fully to the spiritual condition of Israel by confronting the errors and traditions that came out of Jerusalem. I think teenagers are all fairly well known for being uh, fairly, uh, what would you call it, revolutionary at heart. They want to make changes, if not to their brothers and sisters, then maybe to their parents. And uh, I went through high school with um, teenagers, of course, who from a young age were, were um, in their teens were quite political. You know, they were very invested in, in politics from a young age. I, I had no idea about politics, but there you have it. There were others there that were right into that. As an intelligent young man, even at age 12, Jesus would have been conscious of the violations that were going on in the temple. He would have been aware of the laws and traditions that were actually contradicting much of God's word. And he would have been aware of many of the deficiencies of the, of the rulership and how that they uh, were, were actually squandering their position as teachers of God and not actually ministering to the nation as they should have. On the other hand, 
I could well imagine that it was not Jesus' wish to remain in quiet, lonely Nazareth, working as a carpenter. Not far away from Nazareth was Capernaum, and it was at a crossroads. It was a very busy place with a, a lot of traffic and a lot of commerce. Nazareth, by comparison, uh, was up on a hill, um, isolated and secluded. I imagine that Jesus was becoming conscious of his, of his um, need to be ministering to his people and uh, the, his, the destiny that was, that was um, set for him and that he had a temperament and a disposition to do that. Now we all have our own different natural temperaments and inclinations that suit different vocations and careers, but I think most of us know what it is like to be dissatisfied or unenthusiastic about some occupation we find ourselves in. Well, Jesus can sympathize. He knows how that feels, that sense of restraint or dissatisfaction. And he does so obviously because he went through something of the same experience himself. Whether it was a great burden to him, whether he actually uh, suffered it grievously, I could not say. But he would have been aware of a hankering to be doing something differently uh, in Jerusalem than what he was doing in Nazareth. So I suggest that Jesus spent 18 years as a carpenter uh, and as a craftsman in Nazareth and in the surrounding region because God knew that it was the best situation for Jesus to learn such things as patience, tolerance, and that needful waiting upon God. Jesus was in that situation because he honored and submitted himself to God first of all, and therefore to the parents whom God had provided for him. It's a funny thing to think that God had provided his son parents. Obviously, children always come um, after parents, but God foreknew who Jesus' parents would be, and so he had raised them up to be the parents of his only begotten son. Joseph and Mary were in their particular situation, both geographically, socially, and even economically, because God had placed them there, all in preparation for Jesus' birth and for his upbringing. From the beginning of creation, according to Genesis 2, verse 24, and quoted by Jesus, a man shall leave his father and mother to cleave to his wife, which I take to mean that God's arrangement is for a man to remain with his parents until he gets married. Obviously, there were plenty of deviations from that principle, and it was um, not um, rebuked or, or um, punished whenever it happened. For example, Isaac stayed with, with uh, his father uh, until, until Rebekah came to him. On the other hand, uh, their, their son Jacob... Uh, left his parents and went to seek a wife a long way away from them and, and obviously uh, was away from them many years. Uh, so that was quite an opposite situation. But I take what it says in Genesis 2.24 to mean that God's original plan was for the man to remain with his parents until he was married. And so Jesus, I imagine, did remain with his parents continually until at about age 30, he started his public ministry. Jesus himself didn't marry in the flesh, of course, for the church was to be his bride. And remaining with Joseph and Mary until he was about 30 was probably very unusual among Jewish men. One effect of this is that Jesus would have had longer close fellowship with his parents and also with his siblings, some of whom were probably um, over 15 years younger than Jesus. So in a sense, Jesus had a natural family that he did not actually beget, but which God provided through Joseph and Mary. And growing up as he did, um, becoming responsible or partly responsible for the care and nurturing and teaching of younger and younger siblings, Jesus was learning to relate to uh, ages, age groups that were very diverse from his own. Mary and Joseph were evidently a match literally made in heaven. 
They were God's perfect choice as mother and stepfather for God's special son. Each of them had their special virtues and strengths, which are indicated by the gospel records. Mary was sublimely word-oriented, and she clearly had a very good knowledge and memory and understanding of the scriptures. Her hope was staunchly focused on God's promises, and her faith was strong. She straightaway believed the words of the angel who promised her that she would conceive, and she trusted God for the promise's fulfillment. She was a thoughtful person. She often meditated on difficult matters to try to understand them. And she was resilient. She was physically strong enough to make the journey to Bethlehem while she was pregnant. And she had a mental toughness that caused her to recover from setbacks she had when she, for example, misunderstood Jesus or was corrected by him. And even after she had been estranged from him for some time during his public ministry. One of the greatest scenes of reconciliation actually took place uh, right around the cross when Jesus addressed his mother and uh, um, uh, took care of her, um, uh, her care uh, after he was dead. But of course, it also indicates that Mary was drawing ne near to Jesus and remembering the, uh, the prophecy that was made to her in Luke chapter 2 by Simeon, the prophet who said that uh, a sword would pierce your own heart also. And as she was beholding her son on the cross, pierced and bloody, she would have recalled uh, that prophecy that was made to her probably just a few blocks away uh, somewhere in Jerusalem by Simeon. And it would have all come back to her and she was trying to reconcile herself to her son by being near him at, his, at the time of his greatest suffering. And Jesus accepted that. We're told by Matthew that Joseph was a just man, that is, uh, uh, Jesus' foster father, Joseph, was a just man, but that he was also very gracious and merciful, as if justice doesn't entail grace and mercy. But of course, uh, justice tends to be a stickler for rules, regulations, and law, doesn't it? Whereas grace and mercy uh, can uh, deviate from law and uh, rules and regulations. So Joseph was law-abiding and devoted to the commandments of God in the scriptures, but he wasn't legalistic. He wasn't bound by the legalities of traditional Judaism. And he wasn't bound by the letter of the law. So he was equally open and receptive and obedient to the word of God that came to him by the Holy Spirit. But this suggests to me that he had a strong personal relationship with his, with his God in his daily life, much like King David. And like King David, Joseph had maybe many decades ago as a young man learnt the grace of God. We read, don't we, in, in James chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, uh, the difference between uh, legalism and grace. James writes, Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And even though James was writing probably well after Joseph had died, um, I believe Joseph knew that principle. Even under the law, he had learnt that principle from so many examples through the Old Testament scriptures, such as Joseph in Egypt, the grace and mercy shown to his his brothers, or to uh, the, the likes of Boaz, his, his grace toward uh, the Moabite Ruth, and obviously too would have learnt many lessons from how David learnt about the grace of God, especially uh, when he failed God in, in certain circumstances, but also the grace that he extended to other people himself. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, would, had learnt all these things from the scriptures, I believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, The letter kills, 
but the Spirit gives life. If Joseph had just adhered to the letter of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, Mary might have been put to death. But he was receptive to the Spirit of God. He was uh, in tune with the Holy Spirit. And so, of course, Mary lived uh, in Joseph's company. While Joseph and Mary each had their own individual strengths and weaknesses, God saw to it that the greatest strength or virtue was in their partnership as husband and wife. In their marriage, Jesus would see spiritual relationship at work involving cooperation, unity, friendship, kindness, and of course grace and forgiveness, and a multitude of other spiritual characteristics. So in growing up, under the care and the teaching of uh, Mary and Joseph, Jesus was seeing two people uh, fellowshipping with each other in God. And of course, Jesus was learning from that fellowship. It was like being in a, in a church in his own home. Even though Jesus had no wife and family of his own, he had many younger siblings born to Joseph and Mary over several years. Four brothers and probably about the same number of sisters, some possibly, as I say, 15 or 20 years younger than Jesus. Jesus would not only have observed the parental skills of Joseph and Mary, but would also surely have helped with raising and caring for and instructing his young brothers and sisters. So then, in all these different ways, Jesus continued in subjection to his parents, staying at Nazareth, staying at home, witnessing and participating in the growth and care of Mary and Joseph's family. In all these ways, Jesus learned to patiently wait upon God and to not grow weary in well-doing, but to take the role of a servant. Jesus was evidently well known to the Nazareth community. We learn that from Matthew 13, verse 54, Mark 6, verse 3, and Luke 4, verse 22, we learn of the times Jesus went to the synagogue early in his public ministry. The reaction of these people is interesting because it shows us what these people knew of Jesus from before his public ministry. In Luke 4, after Jesus began to expound from the book of Isaiah at verse 22, it says, All the people were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were proceeding out of his mouth. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? It was as if they were saying, this man looks like Jesus, but he sure doesn't speak like he used to. So there was a change in Jesus as far as he was manifest to, to the people that knew him. But it gives us some indication of what Jesus would have been capable of uh, before his public ministry uh, was authorized by God. Matthew 13 and Mark 6 suggest the same. Jesus began teaching in their synagogue so that the many listeners were astonished and said, what is this wisdom given to him? And where did this man get this wisdom? Isn't this the carpenter's son? There was evidently a force and wisdom and eloquence about Jesus' speaking ministry, which is recorded for us in the Gospels, but which Jesus had not demonstrated before in his daily life. Here was a new, eloquent Jesus, which his family and friends and neighbors had never heard before. So obviously, while growing up and as a grown man, Jesus was not known for being eloquent or loquacious. He wasn't talkative. He wasn't voluble. He wasn't giving vent to all the knowledge that he had. And uh, I take it that Jesus was not given to rhetoric or oratory. That, that was helpful in many respects because as a, as a younger man, Jesus might have been called upon um, to, to um, give rebukes and admonition to all sorts of people and it, and it was not necessarily the right time for Jesus to, to be uh, giving expression to such things. From the same passages in Matthew 13 and Mark 6 of Jesus in the synagogue, we read that the people there were also astonished at his miracles. 
So we learn from this that it's certain that Jesus did not perform miracles while he was growing up in Nazareth because his family and neighbors had never seen or heard anything like Jesus' miracles before. And that is despite all the legends that came later. John's gospel is actually quite clear and emphatic when it says that when Jesus had changed water into wine at Canaan, it was his first miracle. And this took place after his baptism and anointing. Regarding speaking um, ability or volubleness, if, if you want to call it, uh, Proverbs has, has um, uh, some cautions there. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. And so for some 30 years, I believe that Jesus was learning to uh, keep his counsel to himself on many occasions, to not to not speak uh, when he didn't need to. Proverbs 17 verse 27 in the New International Version reads, A man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. Ecclesiastes 5 verses 2 to 3 says, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty to utter anything before God. Let your words be few. Um, King James Version says, A fool's voice is known by their multitude of words. And the Jerusalem Bible says, Foolish talk comes from a multiplicity of words. So in all these ways, Jesus was very careful of his, of his speech, uh, both before and uh, during his, his public ministry. These scriptures which Jesus knew and applied in his day-to-day -day living suggests to me that Jesus was always economical with his words so that he did not vocalize much unless he needed to. I imagine that Jesus always appeared quite a reserved, contemplative person, even when he was busy or in a social environment. For example, I doubt that he ever engaged in much humorous banter or superficial conversation, and he certainly didn't get caught up in gossip or quarrels or murmuring or sarcasm. Instead, Jesus would have readily spoken words to people which would encourage or comfort or advise or admonish. You can study the Proverbs to know how Jesus spoke. It's significant, I think, that early in Jesus' ministry at John chapter 2, during the wedding at Cana, Jesus' mother Mary said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, I don't know if Mary expected Jesus to perform a miracle, but she seemed to have learned from years of experience that Jesus could come up with answers to difficult questions or problems. Now, there is a saying that some people, in particular some Christians, are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. This is to say that their religious profession so preoccupies them in reading and study and prayer and meditation and reverie that they have no time or inclination or capability for basic, practical, necessary day-to-day -day tasks. And I know that this is a weakness that um, I've always been conscious of myself. I'm not, not particularly practical, whether it's on the farm or with uh, engineering or electronics or whatever it may be. The saying can also relate to people who mistakenly believe that they must so wait on God for every decision and outcome and solution in their daily life that they don't make the effort or take the practical steps to help themselves. I've even seen testimonies on, on the internet of Christians, Christian women, I should say. I don't know, it probably happens to men as well, um, who um, don't buy a dress, a certain dress, unless, unless they're convinced that uh, that was the color that God wanted them to wear. Just little things like that. But of course, it can happen in much more portentous sort of things like uh, choosing a spouse or um, going to a certain city to live or um, um, pursuing a certain career. So there's, there's a wide range of examples of this. Some Christians who don't read the Bible but believe God will fill their mind with knowledge and understanding of his ways. Others who won't consult a doctor when they're sick or injured in the expectation that God will heal them miraculously. But Jesus was clearly an active and practical man he did not live like a hermit or a monk, but growing up he was continually exposed 
to the daily lives and works of his household, his hometown, and his district. And he observed, experienced, and participated in the practical activities that took place around him. We can know some of the practical activities Jesus was involved with by considering his parables drawn from the upbringing he experienced. Jesus knew how fishermen fished. He knew the work involved in sowing and harvesting grain and making bread. He knew about planting and maintaining vineyards. And he knew about shepherding and searching for lost sheep. We can almost be almost sure that Jesus knew these things not only from observation, but also from actual participation. And uh, it, it makes me wince a bit to think that when Jesus spoke about the, the grit or the, the moat in a person's eye and then described the beam in somebody's eye, that he had probably um, witnessed such events. Sometimes terrible accidents happen on, on, in, in workplaces, working with timber or um, masonry or, or metal or whatever it may be. And when Jesus described a beam in somebody's eye, he may well have seen such a thing. It, it is, is known to happen. Certainly Jesus was a carpenter by trade, but there were surely down times in the carpentry trade when Jesus would find extra work elsewhere. As a hired servant, Jesus would have known what it was to take on the role of a servant. Quite likely too, Joseph and Mary and their family might have enjoyed times of comparative prosperity when diversification into other business ventures might have taken place. And so we, we get hints of Jesus' knowledge of these things in Proverbs that relate to commerce and trading and uh, business ventures. So in all these different ways, Jesus would have learnt from practical experience the lessons about business, employment, financial management, which feature in his parables. One exception I can think of straight away is his parables about warfare. Uh, there's no question that Jesus would not have engaged in warfare or in uh, fighting or in killing. Uh, so there, there is an exception to that, that uh, principle. Beside dealing with down-to-earth matters, Jesus was also exercised as, as to more theoretical or academic matters, which also feature in his discussions in the Gospels. So, for example, when Jesus was asked by his disciples, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind, in John 9 verse 2? Or when he discussed the Galileans whose blood Pontius Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them at Luke 13. Or when Jesus' enemies brought a woman caught in adultery and demanded a judgment from him in order that they might have grounds for accusing him at John 8. In all these cases, when Jesus was confronted with these questions or dilemmas, Jesus was prepared. And we know why or how Jesus was so well prepared. It was because he applied himself mentally he always put his mind to good use. He willfully and purposefully occupied his thoughts at all times with those qualities which Paul enumerated in Philippians 4 verse 8. Whatever is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute, those things that are excellent and worthy of praise, Jesus trained his mind to dwell on these things and to ponder them. And of course, he was drawing lessons and examples from the Old Testament uh, in those things that he could see in life's experiences. Jesus as a child and as a young man was keenly aware of how easily we can be distracted from right thoughts, sometimes by circumstances out of our control, but as often as not by our own deviance or inattention or, or weariness. Jesus' solution to this must have included his taking heed to Psalm 1 which says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way that sinners go, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So Jesus was careful about the influences that he exposed himself to, and was careful not to be distracted by ungodly reasoning or attitudes. Now, I'm, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by people at home who are Christians, but I can be one of those like this um, person 
uh, or I, I can be uh, the opposite of the person in Psalm 1 simply by sitting down in front of the TV. I can, I can be exposed to uh, people, uh, uh, the counsel of the wicked by the things that I watch on TV. I can go to places where sinners go by watching TV. I can be in the seat of scoffers by the sort of people that um, confront us on TV. So even such a thing as that, and of course for TV we can, we can read, um, we can say computers or, or books or whatever it might be, magazines and so forth, movies, etc. We, we still have to be conscious of these things. So Jesus was careful about all these things that, uh, that, that he could have been exposed to and was careful not to be distracted by ungodly reasoning or attitudes. But instead, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Jesus understood first from his parents' counsel and instruction and then from his own learning and reasoning, he understood that God's word was unique and exclusive. It is the only source of knowledge approved by God. It was the only knowledge that would approve Jesus to God. And so Jesus resolved that worldly and human philosophies or theories or science or speculation or superstition, none of these things would distract him from the standard of God's word. So Jesus could truthfully say what Psalm 119 reads from verse 97. I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. God's commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they, God's commandments, are always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the elderly, because I have observed your precepts, which is to say, obeyed your commands. Jesus knew from a child that he had to choose between God's way and man's way. Isaiah 7 verse 15 says, He will eat curds and honey that is baby food, at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. So what we have just read of Jesus in Psalm 119, that his extraordinary wisdom and insight and understanding exceeded all his contemporaries, this was the outcome of the decision or intention or resolution that Jesus had made from his very early childhood and which he continued to live by during his whole life. So that the psalm continues... I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. So we see that Jesus never allowed himself to be distracted from the scriptural course. He would not deviate from God's word. In every area of his life and at every moment, Jesus kept the word in focus and allowed that word to reveal God's true perspective on every observation, every contemplation, every choice and every decision without Jesus being blinded or confused or confounded by human feelings or reasoning. Every moment he was doing this. So when Jesus observed the night sky, he wasn't befuddled by astrological speculation or superstitions, but beheld the glory of God and the work of God's hands. He didn't fuss or fret over worldly politics, but considered how that God rules in the kingdoms of men. He didn't become despondent at personal loss or deprivation, but noted that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these different ways, whatever his age or location, whatever company he was in, and whatever activity he was involved in, Jesus continued meditating on God's word and allowing it to direct him and to form his character and personality. And this is how it was that in Luke's word, Jesus kept on increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man.